uh, welcome everybody uh, to our first uh, panel discussion in this venue. Um, I hope the coffee was great. I certainly needed it this morning. So, just um, one of the things I was quite interested. We've talked a bit about um, uh, Colin before about security from a business perspective, but the one story that's been grabbing me this year is when you have a guy called Jeff Bezos, head of um, Amazon, owner of Amazon, a biggest shareholder in Amazon, and all his intimate pictures get hacked and put out there uh, with his girlfriend, as it sort of all plays into that. So, I mean, this is pretty amazing when someone at that level doesn't actually look after their own personal security, and they're right in the thick of it. So. I'd like, like a bit of a sort of play on, um, what do you think goes on there personally with people that they, you know? Sometimes, yeah. So um, <laughs> uh, it's an interesting one. I, c I can probably be guilty of that myself sometimes, <laughs> where you, you spend so much focus on why, what you're doing in your business and keeping yes. your business safe that sometimes you forget about what happens when you go home. Social media is one of the worst elements because people change, it's like their brains switch as soon as you go onto social media and suddenly it's like, oh, I'll share everything with the world and no real thought about what's gonna necessarily happen with it. So I, I, yeah, I do think it, it's kind of a little bit of the way the brain operates as such. Um, yeah, social media to me is one of the best tools if you're ever wanting to actually socially engineer somebody as well. Yeah, when, if you're going to break into someone's account, like get access to their Gmail or something like that, and you want to use their challenge password, usually you can find the answer in their social media pages. Because most people have a challenge password, you know, what's the name of my dog or something like that. Just Google their social media page and there'll be a picture of them with, here's Fluffy and me running down the beach. Well, you've just got that answer. Then you can get access to all their intimate details from there. Yeah, I plead guilty on that one. I'm going to go away and have a look at, um, at my own security after this. Um, but this instance is really interesting because it's been used um, against Bezos, and he had the money mm. and wherewithal to be able to attack the media that actually put it all out there. But again, it's this sort of human, um, human aspect that someone would send intimate pictures to the girlfriend. It gets hacked. Here you are sort of running one of the biggest corporations in the world. And, you know, who's supposed to be secure? What's the dynamic? I mean, I'm interested in what the views of the rest of the panel on this. How can you be so dumb? Well, <laughs> you know. just jumping in there, I think the challenge is it's always utility sort of trumps security. The, the ease of use, the get it done. Um, y you know, who hasn't sort of, you know, to lock your car, and that's, that, that, that's a pretty easy, you know, press a button, walk away thing. But even if, if you're juggling, shopping and whatnot, the odds of you forgetting to do it are, are reasonably high. So I think that's, that's the challenge is we've, um, the surface of uh, how, how applications work, how we, how we integrate, it's all been designed for user experience to make it easy. And I think the challenge for us in the security area is to evolve um, security to make it that easy too. So um, most people are, are, don't want to go back to passwords on your cell phone where we actually prefer the, the swipe pattern or the, or the thumbprint or, or, or the sort of facial recognition, although I, I am challenged with a uh, so bright sunny day, it doesn't always work there. But, um, but I think that's the bit is, um, no matter how rich you are, the, the, the utility of um, using something as opposed to securing it is, is, is a pretty straightforward transaction, the inconvenience of it. And I think the, the counterpoint to that as well is that um, we all have our head in the sand because we don't think it's going to happen to us. And that's an attitude that goes from us personally right through to our businesses. And um, we don't think we're a target. And I think he probably had that mentality that it wasn't going to happen to him. So he was more than willing to uh, play the fine line there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is this human factor that you come up against and, and just kicking it forward to uh, what happens in businesses. I mean, how difficult is it to impress on staffers, CEOs, others, the need for security and what they should be doing, not just in their personal lives, but also in terms of their interface with the company, customers, and so forth, because those figures mentioned before about how trust can disappear, and if you do have a major incident, how that can affect your business as to whether you even have one going forward is, is quite major, and maybe we can bring you in, yeah, yeah, Stephen. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can jump on that one. So it's extremely difficult, and I think, uh, especially for organizations that 
struggle with accountability and responsibility anyways. Um, bringing security into an organization isn't going to work unless that culture actually exists. So it's impossible to bring in a security professional and then expect that you're going to change an underlying cultural problem. So to reverse that, if you're thinking about bringing security into an organization to, to strengthen the security, think about strong leadership, first of all, and, and getting a professional in who, who can actually bring leadership to your organization, but also work with your executive team to help them identify other areas of shortcomings across the organization that may help the security program blossom. So it's not going to happen magically. It's going to, you're going to have to do the hard yards. So depending on the ability of the organization to accept change, um, to, to that degree, your security program will likely be successful. I do think it requires a bit of quantification. I think one of the challenges is, as we've talked about, unless you live in this world day by day, you struggle with the concept because it is, it's a very ethereal thing, cyber. Um, and I think the challenge with for executives is, and anyone managing risk, is your perception of risk is in your day-to-day -day life. And in New Zealand, we have a high trust society and a real perception of low risk. And I do wonder, and I, there's been a lot of debate and personal discussions around, you know, has Christchurch changed that a bit? Because that's reset our paradigm and our thought on risk. But I think that's the bit, and Colin um, talked about it earlier, about identifying your information as an asset, understanding its value in a business. And I think if you ask most organizations, you know, what's your human capital? They could tell you the people they have, the skills they have, what's your differentiator. They could tell you about your plant, your fixed assets, your cash in the bank. But you say, you say to them, your information assets, what are they worth? Where are they? How can you quantify them? And I think that's, if you can get to that point of, of getting organizations to understand their value at risk, um, then, then it's a very different dynamic and discussion at the boardroom because it's around, actually, this is something that it's going to, this, this could take our business out, and therefore, as Stephen says, you're able to engage and you're able to approach the problem of one of changing culture, implementing complex systems, investing, uh, investing sometimes many millions to, to, to make that change to, to uplift security. That's right. Yeah. I mean, at Ports of Auckland, we're investing a lot of money to automate the port, and so there's a, an extraordinary uptake of technology there and an extraordinary uptake of risk. And I think one of the, the areas where sometimes cybersecurity people let the organizations down is we don't contextualize the risk appropriately for the executive. They're not 100% sure what it is that, that they're actually being told. If you go in and tell them that you've got a bunch of servers and they, blah, they don't have patching and blah, 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 it's just totally confusing amongst all the decisions that they need to make in their daily lives to run the business. But if you can boil that down into terms that are a business risk, then I think you stand a much better chance of being successful in your conversation with your leaders. Yeah, um, so how good are we at managing this risk? I mean, you all know the stories that go on behind scenes because sure as heck, companies don't always tell the world when they've actually had a breach. I mean, give us a bit of the inside oil. I uh, you mean how good uh, grading ourselves as professionals? Is that the question? Yeah, how, no, how, how good, how think good we're are doing? companies at managing risk? Yeah. And what do they do when they actually have a breach? Panic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody, everybody has a different idea on how that's supposed to go. Um, having an incident response plan is a is a big piece of it. it um, you know, you don't want to wait until something happens to figure out how you're going to respond to it. So organizations that have, is there anybody in here that works for an organization that doesn't have digital equipment? It's unlikely, right? You're probably living out in um, somewhere in the central Coromandel or something. But the reality is, if, if, you're, if digitization is running your information and your information is then vulnerable to all the things that we've been talking about with Simon and Colin were presenting, then you've got to have some way to respond to that risk if something happens. And so that's really key. Right, incident response is huge. Mm. At Boards of Auckland, we um, invited our colleagues at PwC to help us create a program. And we practice that program regularly and we keep it up to date. And dare I say, we've even used it on a small occasion just to make sure it works. Yeah. I think you're right too, because <laughs> the, the incident response side of things is really key. 
you've got to remember, when an event occurs, it's going to be the most stressful time that an organization faces. The last thing you want to be doing is thinking about what you're going to do on the spot while you're trying to you know, manage that stress that's occurring. And you've got to think also about what's the impact on your employees. It's not just your customers that are impacted by what's occurring, but it's also your employees that are going to be impacted by what's going on. And, and stakeholders. they're going to be just as stressed as well. Yeah. Sorry, and stakeholders as well, your, yeah, and your customers. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think it's uh, really important to uh, control the narrative yourself. You know, Rob Fife's example was the Air New Zealand plane that was leased in uh, France and it went down. His advice from the board was actually to keep quiet and not go to the media until they actually had a bit more information and could uh, control the situation. He made a personal decision that he felt trust and transparency went hand in hand. So he came out and he was actually able to control the narrative from the very outset. So I think when you have a breach, that's really important that you consider that you need to have communication people involved and that's part of the planning as well so that it's not someone else like the media or your competition who's actually talking about it in the media. Uh, so that's one of the things that you need to think about, who needs to be in that room at the start. You're probably going to need a lawyer, you're going to want someone on speed dial that you can talk to very, very quickly. So actually, as Steve said, work out who needs to be part of that incident response plan right from the very outset and make sure they know that they're actually part of that plan and not getting a call at midnight to suddenly find out that they're actually trying to help you in a situation that's going bad very quickly. So how do you deal with your partners in a situation where there's been a breach, your stakeholders, your external uh, players? I mean, how, how do you deal with that? What's that, what, what's that phone call you make? What, what do you actually say, Kendra? <laughs> Look, I, I believe in trust and transparency go hand in hand, and I think that the more open you are and the more you own the fact that you've had this breach uh, and what the ramifications are, and I think you will build customer loyalty and trust and not lose people. I think it's the people who actually don't share information, uh, don't tell you. Uh, there's some really good examples out there. Marriott was very, very slow to come out and talk about their over 500 million customer details, including passports. That's had huge ramifications on that business. So I think, you know, if you are open and transparent and honest with your customers at the outset, you will actually grow their loyalty and, uh, and trust back in your brand. I think it's important to remember that uh, sort of two thirds of the breaches that happen, um, you're not the, the, the company, the organisation, the individual who's affected two thirds of the time, you're not the person who finds out first. Somebody tells you. Um, and if you're lucky, it's, it's possibly a friendly customer or, or GCSB or, or someone like that, but, but more often than not, it's, it's out there. So your ability to control the narrative it, it's not like um, you can go and sit in a dark room and compose it over a week. You, you have minutes sometimes, um, uh, and, and, and that's why it's important to, to figure out who you've got on speed dial, um, who's practiced, who's good at not being a deer in the headlights. Um, as, as Colin said, I've seen that many a time where the, the, the pyramid structure of the organization doesn't actually work well in an incident, because actually the person who deals with operational issues all the time is actually oh, very, very often they are the best person to be in the moment, making effective decisions, that kind of thing. So, um, Colin, so when, when you're looking at, um, from, a, I guess, a sort of surveillance monitoring way across your networks for, uh, for um, cyber uh, security incursions, how, how does that um, work in terms of the customers? If you see something happen, see a pattern happen, it's, it's a difficult one when it comes to customers in particular. So we've got obviously tools that we're looking across our network looking for threats that are occurring. Um, denial of service attacks are usually the most popular ones and we see them occurring against customers all the time, usually related to gaming for some reason. Someone gets fragged in a game so they go to the online denial of service and launch an attack. Um, but it's really difficult if we detect activity that's related to potentially customers that might have been either breached or, or malware infecting a device. It's hard to reach out and contact those, particularly consumer customers, because of all the Microsoft scams that are occurring. Because mm -hmm. you know, what's that phone call look like? Hi, it's Vodafone, your computer may be infected. <laughs> How many people are gonna listen to us when we do that? Um, it's easier with organizations, obviously, because we have a relationship with them and we can reach into those mm -hmm. organizations. But into the broader public, it's a lot more complicated to have that conversation because 
you, you, know, you want people to not trust those things, but then how do we have the conversation and trust with them? It's funny to send out an email that says, please don't read your email, we have some malware on the system, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, that's fascinating. Um, we were talking earlier about um, kicking forward to the Internet of Things and the security that uh, might be necessary around that. And Stephen, um, you're just sort of looking at um, this technological cold war we're in now. I mean, we can look at it domestically, but how do, how do, we, how do we move to this new advanced smart technology world and at the same time um, not be prey to external forces? Wow, that's a, that's a question. Um, I mean, the reality is there's a, the, the, the forces that are at play are really, sort, in, in my mind, sort of East versus West, and they boil down to ideologies. There's a really good article in Foreign Affairs magazine written by an author named Adam Seagal called When China Rules the Web. And in there, it pretty much outlays China's strategy for the Internet which is fundamentally opposed to the way the internet has, has grown up in the last 40, 50 years. Um, the, Western, the Western version, and in particular the American version, is to kind of have the internet out there and just sort of let it grow and let freedom of expression develop that, that capability. China takes a completely different stance on that. China is all about harmony in the, at, at the core of their psyche. and what they want to develop is an internet that they can capitalize on for sure, but that they can, they can actually control because they, they need to be careful that they're able to limit the amount of um, free collaboration and public opinion in the usage of tools. And so these are juxtaposed um, positions on how the internet should develop. And China is a, is a rising star globally, we all know that, and they're well organized and they're going to achieve a lot of their objectives. And so I think the underlying principle is that there needs to be a considerable amount of dialogue to help develop standards that balance out the, the Western ideology and the Chinese ideology. And unless we do that um, you know, diplomatically, I, I think that there's, there's going to be real tussles going on. So. I said a lot there, but that's my view on it. Uh, any others on the panel? Uh, well, I, I guess the challenge with that is um, that's, the, that's the macro, that's the, the, the sort of the really big powers and the traditional way we've looked at diplomacy and detente. Um, and uh, what really changed in 9-11 in and subsequently, you, 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 we've got the rogue agent as well, which is the, the North Korea's... Uh, um, and, and Iraq, Iran, and other states like that where their agenda may be more binary, which is destruction, or achieving some political aim. And then, and then the bit that, that I'm challenged with more on a day-to-day -day basis is what you'd call organized crime. The people who, are, who use um, individuals and organizations' information assets to exploit them for their best advantage. And to give you some perspective, um, it's, it was estimated to be worth three trillion dollars last year, and it's estimated to reach about six trillion dollars in 2022. So that, um, to give you perspective, because that's a really big and extraordinary number with lots of zeros, but um, that's more than the combined trade in marijuana, heroin, and cocaine combined. So. Uh, so if you're a, a person of low morals and want to get into doing something nefarious for a good outcome, uh, you, want, you, you don't have to grow any <laughs> uh, cocaine on the hills of Bogota or anything like that <laughs> and deal with uh, big border guards and AK-47s. You can get into cybercrime and um, it's a very lucrative business. So I think those are those are the f big macro forces that are out there um, that are eerily impersonal, um, and, and that's why the dynamic environment's not going to change any any time soon. So, cyber risk is not going away. It's evolving. It's nuanced. It's complex. It's got very big macro political forces and really good primary capitalistic forces driving it. Yeah, Kendra. I mean, um, you've talked before about um, how you do uh, deal with this risk around. Um, new generation um, and uh, Internet of Things um, platforms. Can you expand on that? 
Well, I think uh, one of the issues that we have, uh, well, there's actually multiple issues, but uh, we bring these internet devices into our business and we bring them into our homes and they're set on a default. So there'll be a username and a password that's just there by default. These aren't devices that we think about actually changing or going in and monitoring or managing. And these are actually being used at the moment for massive big DDoS attacks globally. Uh, they're also being used to capture information. We're very lazy. We don't read our terms and conditions. We just accept. We want instant gratification. We want that app on our phone. So we just go accept, accept, accept. And meanwhile, we've accepted that we actually can now share our contacts with this organisation. We can turn on our microphone on the, and the camera on the TV. And these are apps that are sitting there. Uh, recently, Checkpoint found over 300 apps sitting in the Google store that actually contained malware that had been downloaded over 100 million times. Now, that's a huge expanse threat landscape that suddenly actually either delivering adware or taking information from organisations. But I'd, I'd just like to do a, a, a flip side to all of this risk and everything that we're talking about in the doom and gloom. There is actually a positive aspect to this and um, there is actually a competitive advantage that we can be building into our businesses. If we actually start to make our businesses more secure and our products more secure, that actually gives us a competitive advantage in the market. Customers, you know, Frost and Sullivan did a report last year on uh, online trust, and they found that a company that experienced a significant or major breach lost over half of its customers. Now, I know my business wouldn't uh, survive, and I'm pretty sure most of the audience here, businesses wouldn't survive with over half of your customers leaving you. So we need to think about actually how we retain them, and this is where it becomes a business conversation, not an IT conversation. And if we can actually flip it and we can start to secure our businesses and secure our products, we will build the trust um, and the credibility and retain our customers. So I think we should be thinking about it in terms of uh, economic opportunity as well as a uh, business risk. And, and just looping in um, Colin's earlier point about building the bridge, is you can build secure systems. Um, that's the most frustrating bit. It's just you just, it's slower, <laughs> it requires more thought and more design, it requires security be, to be thought of um, as a requirement when you're building that app. You know, I want to do this with my customers, I want to do A, B and C, and, and then it's not the afterthought of, oh, okay, we're going to launch it, maybe we should check if it's secure. I think that's the challenge, is if that's the time you build it in, and security is a requirement at the beginning. You know, one of the key functions of this app is that my data, the data of us and the customer is going to be secure, that it's going to have great user experience, it's going to be accessible, but it's going to have, um, you know, high integrity, terms and conditions, and when it's launched, it's going to be secure, it's going to be robust, and we've thought about how do we update it and, and those things. And you can have security by design. I think it's, it's really frustrating that, 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 and naturally it's just because it's more expensive and it's more thought required. And I think that's, that's kind of part of why security needs to move out of that back office environment, mm. because it is treated as the last resort. Oh, we're about to go live with this product. Oh, maybe we should get it pen tested at the last minute or something like that. So security does need to be involved in the process right from the beginning. That way, yeah, you're building more robust systems right from the beginning. Well, I that's, think that's we, oh, sorry. No, it's um, okay, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think we should be holding the tech uh, companies, the large tech companies accountable. Microsoft had eight of the 10 top vulnerabilities last year. And they're still producing solutions and putting out insecure code. And we're saying to organizations and businesses that they're responsible for patching, which can have ramifications. You need to test in lab, mm -hmm. you can't put into production, and so on, and there's flow on effect. So we should be saying to these tech companies that they actually need to do a better job with their product that they're delivering in. We certainly don't tolerate it in our consumer electronics. We don't like it in our cars. So why are we allowing software to come out into the market that's actually uh, insecure, and we're consuming it in vast quantities. 
Well, a lot of those people that are selling those products are selling security products as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, just a quick rip round the um, uh, panel uh, while Simon is getting ready to uh, bring the audience questions in. Um, just a quick view on Facebook. What do they need to be doing in terms of security? Practicing it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> I mean, how many records did they expose yeah. last year? Oh, millions. Uh, millions and millions, yeah. email addresses, uh -huh. uh, passwords. Um, yeah, we all use it, don't we? To be fair, they're yeah. a target as well. I mean, they are a target. Yeah. And um, a lot of people use it, and a lot of people want it to work in a lot of interesting ways, and, and in a lot of new ways, a lot of novel ways. And so trying to secure that can be a challenge. And I think it goes back to one of the themes we were talking about earlier. If you're going to, to utilize this technology, especially social, me so, uh, social media, you just need to be judicious about what you're going to put out there. You know, don't put something out there you don't want the world to see. Mm -hmm. Because chances are, it, first of all, it's going to be on a server somewhere. So once you put it out there, you've lost control. And even if it is never discovered, it's still there. And it always must be in the back of your mind that, you know, what if? So. Just be careful about that. Okay. And I think, I think one of the other things with Facebook, just to wrap it up, um, yep. is that it's also addictive. So no matter what happens with Facebook, because it's so addictive to people, they'll always go back to it eventually. Yeah. So it's very difficult. I think uh, Adrian said a few, right at the beginning, utility trumps security. We want that access to yeah. Facebook. We want these things, but exactly. we're willing to compromise security as a result until we get affected by it. Thank you very much to our panel. The, uh, the questions have been flowing in, and you have been using that democratic process. We have a number of questions that have completely risen to the top of the uh, tree. And this is a very, very, very practical ones to start with. I think I'll direct this one to you, Colin, firstly. What are your thoughts? This has been the most, most upvoted question. What are your thoughts on using public Wi-Fi, such as the Victory Wi-Fi network? <laughs> <laughs> Did you ask that question? <laughs> um, always use uh, VPN, is my view. Um, I, I never connect to public Wi-Fi if I can avoid it. Um, I suppose that's one of the joys of working for a telco. But um, even even though you will no doubt have greater security yeah. in your phone. But if you're going to connect to any form of public Wi-Fi, use some form of VPN at least. Add to that one. Pragmatically, given investment in cybersecurity can be endless, what do SMEs actually need to prioritise, Kendra? I think, uh, first of all, start with what is it that you need to protect. I think both Adrian and, and Colin have talked about this. What's really important to you? Is it your customer information? Uh, look, ransomware, you're more than likely to lose your accounts receivable. Uh, SMEs in the US are shown to go out of business. 60% uh, of SMEs in under six months if they've been ransomed for you because they can't actually go out and collect the money. So actually work out what it is that you need to protect and, and believe me, there are things that uh, people are after. So don't say there's nothing of interest here, they're not gonna go after me. It could be an invoice scam taking your money, whatever it is, think about what's important to you to be able to keep functioning as a business over the next six months and then look at that in terms of what you need to protect. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one's come, someone's put their name on. Martin, this one comes from Martin Ferris. Ooh, jumped, jumped around. Cybersecurity insurers have started using active war clauses to not pay out, even though attribution isn't foolproof. Here's the question itself. Should we bother with cyber insurance? Oh, Adrian, go on. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, A professional will say no. <laughs> I, I think that's the right question, which is the what am I buying? Um, and, and it's intriguing because I've seen the industry evolve from nothing which was um, the first policies that came out, uh, there were very little in terms of conditions, and they paid out. So if you got ransom weird, you, you got to pay out. Um, and what's happened is as the actuarial models develop, as the policies develop, there are going to be more and more exclusions. It, you know, insurers are, are there to make a profit on the fact that they you know, take risk across an, an entirely broad market. Um, when that risk it hurts them more than it rewards them, then the terms and conditions change. And I think, um, I think so, so where organisations come to me and they talk about their cyber security policy, it goes back to Kendra's question and, and what we've laboured on, which is, well, what do you want to ensure? What are you worried about and therefore what's the thing you're going to ensure? But because it doesn't, 
it doesn't provide blanket coverage. And the other thing insurance does not well is no matter how well it is marketed, it does not do anything to prevent it happening. And they are not the SAS uh, squad that lands on your environment and sorts it out. You know, insurance, all they do is they give you financial compensation once you have gone through the fun and game process of making a claim. So just, you just understand it. It is a valuable tool. It is something you should consider. It is something you should have in your toolbox. But it is not a silver bullet, that is for sure. Applies to all aspects of life, of course, Absolutely. and assessing risk and insurance. So when I mean, the question, should we bother with cyber insurance, the answer is depends. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right. Thank That's you. my so answer for everything, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> How much trust can you put in password vaults, like LastPass? I don't know who to direct this to, but you haven't had one, Stephen. So want to have yeah. a go? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I put a lot of trust in them, but only because the alternatives aren't, aren't as good. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is, for the sake of all the passwords and usernames that people collect over a long period of time, which are many if you, if you stop and either, for those of you that write them down, my wife keeps them in a place, I shouldn't say where it is, but it's, um, she writes it all down, and if somebody gets control of that, they run encrypted, she'll get access to it. So as an alternative to having multitude of password and user accounts written down all over the place in insecure methods, I think that they're a, a reasonable choice. I think if you're going to do it at the enterprise level, though, it really has to be engineered into the system mm -hmm. so to make sure that the, the risks of especially privileged access accounts like system administrators aren't exposed. And the, the, the notion would be that if, if somebody can get into that, to that pot of gold, which is that, that whatever that capability is that's managing those passwords, um, they're going to have access to the kingdom. So it just has to be managed. But I, I, I think you know, they're no different than most of you are using a, a network access account based on probably Active Directory or some other solution. So if they're done right, they work well. I think so it's you a good use idea. Password Vault? I do. I use LastPass. Yep. Everyone? Yeah. Yep. But also uh, two-factor or multi-factor authentication as well, layered on top of that. So look at all the apps that you're using. Make sure that you can turn it on. Use Google Authenticator if you don't have a tool. Uh, but always have at least two layers of um, identification to go on. Two-factor authentication, two -factor yeah, authentication. Yeah, as a Absolute yeah. must. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the key with it, you know, just remember that, that that's your, your good alternative to the reuse the password that you because that's a disaster. I mean, that's <laughs> it's probably one of the biggest challenges out there, that the reuse of password, which means you use it at some you know, fashion boutique whose system gets hacked, and, and, and through that, they have access to your bank account. So, and we have, so one bit I would say is that in the New Zealand marketplace, that dynamic has changed. So when these Facebook or LinkedIn or uh, extra hacks happen, and the username, your username and password, email address on our shared, we see instantly, or within a couple of hours, a replay attack happening. So that means somebody takes their database and they would go and run it against New Zealand bank accounts. And and you know, those replay attacks from my customers, um, we would say that they will get a, a 2 to 5% return rate um, guaranteed. And sometimes it's as high as 50%. So that, that means that the, the username and password will be recognized and because it's been reused. My life is basically over. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, anyone else? No, just me. <clears throat> New Zealand cyber legislation is minimal and reactive, not proactive compared to others. Does corporate governance have a commercial or moral obligation to fill the gap? Ooh. I'm, I'm happy to, Go to run with that. I mean, I can, I can tell you that um, we've had discussions because of the incident response um, capability that we've designed at Ports of Auckland. We've had discussions about when we should report, when we shouldn't report, especially based on New Zealand's what I consider lax reporting laws uh, against global standards. Mm. And the conversation is looking at um, moral, the moral grounds, the ethical grounds, commercial, the compliance grounds. And we've talked through how we would make a decision if something happened and who we would have to communicate to and under what basis we would do that. And so really, I think uh, outside of the compliance and legal framework, which is, which is the kind of the void that you're describing, it really comes down to morals and ethics. And, um, you know, what would be the impact 
to, to an individual or to a company or to our commercial relationships or other stakeholders. So, yep, yep we do fill the gap. Yep. I, I think um, health and safety is a really good example. Uh, businesses' behaviour didn't actually change until there was legislation, carrot and stick. And I think we're going to see that in cyber security as well. Uh, we'll see it with the data privacy. It hasn't really got teeth. It probably isn't actually as strong enough as what we see internationally. But we'll start to see legislation and regulation come into this space in New Zealand. Australia has led the way really, really impressed with their stance on organisations like Facebook, where they'll be fining them if they don't remove uh, violent content within a certain time frame that they've specified. I think we need to travel down that road as well in New Zealand. Thank you very much. Here's a question that obviously is, uh, has affected a number of people here, and again, practically related to, to the application at management level. How do you circumvent blockers at management level when it comes to addressing security issues? Quite often we know what to do, but ideas never make it past management. You're trying not to laugh, Kendra. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? How do you get past it? How do you get... They don't make it past management. Management doesn't understand IT. Is that the first problem? I, I think it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you see, it's not an IT problem. Yeah, yeah. It's a business problem. It's a business problem. So it's, a cultural thing. It's, it's a cultural thing. So first of all, I think um, the question would be, do we want to be here in, in 12 months or 24 months? You know, we, we have to adapt or we die. The evolution of the threat landscape's moving so fast that we have to be moving with it. And if we don't, we won't be in business. And I think... Uh, organisations need to look at some of the consequences of other breaches. Yahoo's about to pay out $117 million uh, for a breach that occurred in 2016 and 2013. Can your organisation actually survive paying out something like that? Uh, so I think we have to change the, the narrative with the boards and with the management and make it a, a business conversation. So it's not about selling the idea, it's about selling the whole concept of two management. Yeah. You've yeah, got to be on board. And, and it's about showing how it's supporting the business as well going forward. You can't sell fear at the management layer, it just doesn't work. You've got to show how whatever you're trying to achieve is actually going to support the business as it moves forward as well. So yeah. I think it's the way you shape the conversation is really key. Yeah. Yeah. Competitive yeah. advantage. Because uh, the biggest problem I, I see when an organisation you know, says, uh, like I haven't been able to get support for this initiative, and I say, well, tell me the initiative, and it'll be explained to me as they need a system. And I would go, well, I wouldn't give you the money for that either. <laughs> because you actually have to ta talk about the impact, which is um, I want to reduce this risk, and you talk about it in the impact of this is what it means, as Kendra said, this could, this could ruin our reputation, we could go out of business. It has to be tangible to the decision maker. Um, and, and that's a very different thing. So, you know, no, no one gets fired for saying, oh, I didn't want to buy that system. But they could be fired for, I wasn't told about this risk and I decided to do nothing about it. Or I got told about this opportunity and decided, I made an executive decision for the firm that I wasn't going to do anything about it. And that's a very different thing. So it's what are you communicating? And I, I frustratingly see it all the time. It's like, oh, we need a SOC or we need a SEAM or we need some four letter acronym. And you go, well, I wouldn't give you money for that. Tell me what you, what you really want to do with this, this bit of investment. I'd like to just add, add, I know we're running short on time, but I'd like to add that I'd like to add something controversial, and I think it's time for everybody to grow up a little bit about technology. And that's at the executive and the board levels as well. And what I mean by that is, for years, management has had to understand how finances work, investments, customer relationships. These are things that are just part of doing business day to day. Well, technology is now part of our business day to day. We no longer can just make excuses to say, well, that's not my generation, or I'm not very good with technology. I think there needs to be a concerted effort to actually make it part of your business. And it has to be at the highest level, because if you're not understanding that area of your risk, um, as we've been pointing out today, you're, you're basically hanging your business out to dry. So that's what I have to say. What a great note to finish on. You have been warned sufficiently. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, will you please put your hands together for our panel.